uh, which comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, and then verses 11 through 12. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came down to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native tongue? I mean native language. <laughs> we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Amen. May God add a blessing to this reading this morning. Amen. 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 Gagud agaf nagar gagud. Again, wagelkum tanu. Vagalagi maginagas tagarigis. Right. All right. <laughs> that was actually a little language that my best buddy in high school and I used to use all the time. And we could speak it fluently because, you know, we're good like that. And uh, we spoke in front of the teachers, made them a little crazy, spoke in front of our parents, made them a lot crazy. I know that because uh, my buddy Robin's mom spent Thanksgiving with us this last Thanksgiving and she told me how crazy it made her. <laughs> Um, and I believe it made my family, uh, my friends and family a little bit crazy too, but it, it's called og talk, and you just basically put an og right before any of the vowels. And so it's uh, maybe slightly a little bit more difficult than the infamous pig Latin, which of course is putting the first sound of a word at the end of the word. Um, so uh, where in og talk my name would be Shagarigan, and... Um, in Pig Latin, it would be Aaron Shea. See, I'm, I don't like to brag very much, but I am fluent in both those languages. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I am what you might consider a linguist. <laughs> and, um, and almost fluent in English as well. <laughs> no, really, seriously. I am very impressed by linguists. I actually once met a woman who who fluently spoke seven different languages and could actually speak nine different languages, but two of them she didn't consider fluent. Um, and that's incredible, because I think languages are an art. It's amazing to see um, intelligence like that. I took, I think, about five years of Spanish, and um, that probably could make Pam and Nancy laugh, because they were with me in Acapulco, where I would just say, oh, buenos dias, and walk away as quickly as possible, because I didn't want anybody to talk back to me, because I had no idea what they were saying. <laughs> I am not that good with languages. But I am, I am totally enthralled with this scripture here, where the disciples are here asking God, Jesus has already gone back up to heaven, and they're asking God to come and infuse them, be part of us, help us, where are we supposed to go, what are we supposed to do from here? They're lingering, waiting for God's presence. And here comes the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, not only are they speaking in tongues, but they're speaking actually in a way that everybody else around can completely understand them in their own language, in their own dialect, in their own accents, that can completely understand them. That is incredible to me. Um, I, I actually, where the dot, dot, dot is in the scripture, I took it all out because I didn't want to have to read it twice, but I will read it right now. They didn't speak, the disciples, all, and I'm going to say they may have spoke multiple languages, probably did, because they often um, studied Greek and Hebrew, and so they probably spoke a couple different languages. But listen to the languages that this day they were speaking. The languages of the Parthians, the Midis, the Elamites, Elamites, the Mesopotamians, those from Judah, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Persia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and Libya. That's what's listed as the languages that they were speaking. That's incredible. I think we, we sometimes read this and wherever your theological views on, are on, on the gift of tongues, that's fine, whatever they are. But we read it and kind of get distracted either to to back our view for or against or whatever, get distracted 
and, and don't think about the awesomeness of this moment. What an incredible miracle. And I mean, let's just say, forget the tongues of fire that came down and rested on them. That must have been incredible. <laughs> Even forget that they're speaking in all these different languages, that, which is pretty incredible. But how about this miracle? It's probably the first and maybe even the last time in the history of the Christian church that the church was actually speaking to the point where the world could understand. That's incredible. I know, it's sad. Some of you understand that's really sad because it shouldn't be that way. But what an incredible miracle that must have been to be a part of. And it's funny because the, the crowd initially began to make fun of them. Now, just as a little side note, isn't it funny that sometimes when something spiritual happens that we don't quite understand or relate with, rather than seeking to understand or relate, the easiest by far thing that we can do is laugh at it. It's true. It happens. I'm guilty. I, you know, things happen that maybe don't coincide with my theology or my experience. First thing I want to do is mock it. See, I'm, I'm willing to be guilty. <laughs> we do that. So, you know, this, this crowd was going, what the heck? Okay, I know. Hmm, looks like somebody's had a little bit too much to drink already this morning. And that's what they started saying. Eh, that's human nature. That's what happens. But here's the other miracle that happened. Peter, and I consider this a miracle because if you look right. back through the gospel at Peter... Peter has a long, outstanding history of putting his foot in his mouth often. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this would have been a great opportunity for Peter to say, Oh yeah, you want to mock me? Hmm. He didn't do any of that. He started to talk to them. And he started to talk to them through biblical knowledge, in biblical faith, and offering biblical hope. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit this morning, is Peter and the words that he used. First of all, he talked about biblical knowledge. Now, I'm just going to warn you right away. I'm going to get a little rough here. But usually when I do that, you should, you should have full confidence that that's because I'm preaching to myself. The harder I get on it, the more I'm preaching to myself. So it's okay. Thank you, I hope. <laughs> I really believe that spiritual knowledge is one of those lost arts in the Christian church today. Especially the church here in America. I feel that we've become so incredibly apathetic yes, yes, to spiritual yes. knowledge. <clears throat> and I think there's a couple reasons why. And the first one, again I'm going to warn you, it hurts a little bit. But I've been bleeding all week as I've studied. The first reason that I think that we have become apathetic to spiritual knowledge is because we are lazy. Mm -hmm. It is more important to us to put our feet up and flip on the TV than to pick up the Bible and start seeking the will of God. It's more important to us, I'm even going here, to pick up the bestseller because people said it's a godly book and start reading it to get the knowledge of God rather than picking up our Bible to get what God has said to us in our lives. It's easier. I think about... Um, and, and I'm not dissing this book. I thought it was a great book. I read it a couple times because it was good. Rick Warren wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. Very simple book, easy to read, great <coughs> spiritual principles telling you that, you know, you are called to go into all the world, to, um, to teach people about God, to be disciples, to worship. It's all the purposes, the five purposes of your life as a Christian. And they're all good. They're great. They're very... But... Let me just say this. It's like me writing on a piece of paper, your name is Ken, and giving it to you, and you looking at it and going, my name is Ken, that's awesome. It was so easy for me to read and understand. Because really, the things in that book should have been that obvious to us. Because they are all through the Bible, littered through the Bible. And if we read the Bible and study the Bible, we should start to be able to understand that stuff without having to rely on all the aids and crutches that are out there. Now, having said that, once we start studying and reading and knowing the Bible, mm -hmm. those things are great because they'll maybe give you a different perspective or insight. But boy, we are so lazy that that becomes the only food that we eat spiritually. And that's really sad. See... Peter was able to 
talk to them about where he was because Peter was a student of the Word of God. It's not because he memorized a couple scriptures in Sunday school. It's not because he learned the latest song on Caleb Radio and it happened to quote scripture so he knew it. He was a student of the Word of God. And he was able to answer because the Holy Spirit gave him the power to do so. The second reason I think, so first, I think we're lazy. Then secondly, for those who, well, still, you're still probably lazy if, if this is you, but I think sometimes we avoid having to study the Word of God because we just know we're gifted and the Holy Spirit's going to bless us when it's necessary. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we do it. I'm going to tell you straight up, I, I have been so guilty about this in the past. Now, I went to, uh, I'll say a Pentecostal Bible, Bible college, and you start to, I took homiletics, which is the science of preaching, and I skated through that class. But in that class, I kind of took it like this. 10% was study. 90% was working on delivery. 90% <laughs> was going, God, inspire me. Bless me. Help me to be charismatic. Help me to... Wow, that's really sad. It shouldn't be that way. I might get more people to listen to me, but maybe all I'm feeding them is a slice of bologna when they needed a feast. We need to study, study, study. The Word of God doesn't come to us through osmosis. All right. I do believe that God can work that way. Uh -huh. I'm just going to tell you straight up, God does not work that way. I know people who have slept with the Bible under their pillow just thinking, oh, it's going to be so good. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You have to crack it open. You have to say, God, teach me. Not just, and I also know people who, they get into the, their Bible study, their yearly plan for reading the Bible, read the Bible in a year, which is fine. I'm all good for that. But I also need to tell you that the scripture a day will not keep the devil away. That is not the formula. All right. All right. Open true. the Bible and read it uh -huh. to learn it, to know uh -huh. it, to say, God, what are you telling uh -huh. me? What were you saying then to what are you telling me now? How does this affect my life? How can I live this in my life? That's how we need to study the Bible. And it's not about osmosis and it's not about laziness. It's about learning and growing and choosing to be a mature Christian. And we can read through it. David in Psalms 119 said, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now can we imagine really truly knowing the word of God enough that where we walk, God's will directs us because we know the word of God. The path that we take, the word of God has already laid out in our life. And I know that hasn't always been the case for me. Uh -huh. We need to know in knowledge the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourself approved, a yes, worker yes, unto yes. God. How many times do we study to say, God, I want to mm. do what you want me to do? All right. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Yes. Now find it interesting, the word there, destroyed, we see destroyed again in the New Testament where it says the enemy... Uh, no, I'm using the wrong one. The, the devil comes to steal, yes. kill, and destroy. destroy. Yes, Lord. So, we are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe we should start seeking knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's a way we can combat the enemy. Yes. Lord. I think we need to take it serious. So Peter could answer what they were saying, what they did not understand. He could say, no, let me tell you what the Word of God says, because he knew the Word of God. He was able to quote the prophet Joel because he knew the Word of God. And I think that's the first and, and one of the powerful truths in this is that when the Holy Spirit worked through him, the Holy Spirit was able to use what he had already studied, what he had already learned, and what he had already become in spiritual knowledge. Secondly, Peter spoke in faith. Now, this one's a, um, it, it sounds like an obvious one, but it can be a tough one. Can you imagine standing in front of a crowd while the crowd is mocking you and saying, God is working through me right now. 
I mean, it's one thing for me to stand up here because you all came to hear me preach. And so I know I can say, God's working through me. And you expect me to say it. But I'm talking about a crowd that's mocking you, laughing at you, calling you drunk, or saying, you obviously have no idea what you're saying. To be able to stand up and say, God's working through me here and now, I believe it. That's called faith. And Peter was a man of faith, and the Holy Spirit was able to use that faith. This same man, now let me say this, this same man, maybe a couple weeks or, or perhaps a couple, did I hit that? Or perhaps a couple months ago, do I need to grab another mic? Are you okay? Hello? I don't know what happened. Grab the mic. I can do this. So, this same man, two, maybe, two weeks, maybe a couple months prior, had just denied Christ. At probably the lowest moments of Christ's life, this man said, I do not know that man. Don't blame me. Don't put me in with him. So I'm not saying Peter was always the strongest guy, but I'm saying that at this point, when the Holy Spirit came into his life, yes, he yes. was infused with faith too, to be able to say, God has used me. God yes. is putting me here right now for this very moment. That's incredible faith. It is one thing to know in our head that God is moving in our worship, isn't it? We know it. We believe it. Yes, yes. How about knowing in our head that God is moving in our lives? Sometimes that's a little more difficult. It's one thing to know cerebrally in our head that God wants to encourage people. Yes. It's a completely other thing to say, God has called me right now to be an encouragement to you. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to do it in faith. It's one thing to know that God heals. Oh, we can quote the scriptures, by His stripes we are healed. It's another thing to stand up and say, you are going to be healed today as I lay hands on you. I believe God has called me to do this. That's some faith. That's not easy. But that's where Peter was at this moment. When they were mocking him, he said, God is using me. God has put me here. God has given me these words, mm -hmm. and now I'm going to talk to you. Mm -hmm. So Peter spoke in knowledge. He spoke of his faith. But the third thing, and this is key, this is where it all comes together, is he spoke in hope. Yeah. He spoke offering hope to the people that he spoke to. Now, it's kind of, I'm a visual person, so sometimes I move my hands, and you probably don't have a clue what I'm going to do, so I'm going to try and really explain it. But I see it as, Peter sought the knowledge of God up here. And God brought it down to him to have faith that God was in Peter right there. And that's good. That's a great thing. I think sometimes for us Christians, that's where it stops. But Peter it didn't stop there. Peter said, now that I have this right here, I'm going to put it out here to you. I'm going to offer hope to you. This is why this is happening today. This is why we are speaking these languages. This is why you think we're drunk. Because God has come for you. Because God loves you. Uh -huh. Because you were called by God. That's the hope offering out. Now we leave it right here and don't push it away. When you think about it, when, uh, when streams go into a lake and then there's no outlet and it just stays there, it becomes stagnant. Yeah. It's disgusting. When, when a fire comes and there's, there's nowhere for it to go and grow, it eats uh -huh. itself up. It dies as it consumes itself. But I think in a Christian life, it's even worse. When we don't let it out, it's no longer just something that's going to die. It is this reeking of hypocrisy stench that we carry around with us. When we say we're Christians and we choose not to give it out... There's a problem. Because Christ came to give, period. Greater love has no one than this, that he gave his life for a friend, but Christ gave it while we were all still sinners. Christ gave. Christ come to, came to give. Give. <laughs> his whole purpose in life was to give everything he had. How dare we say that we're Christians and we don't give it away? We just keep it right there so we can feel comfortable with it. In 1890, Frederick Huntington wrote this quote in Forum magazine. Did you catch that date? That was over 100 years ago he wrote this quote. 
It is not scientific doubt, not atheism, not pantheism, not agnosticism, that in our day and in this land is likely to quench the light of the gospel. It is a proud, sensuous, selfish, luxurious, church-going, hollow-hearted mm -hmm. prosperity. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Mm -hmm. And yet, how many times can we look at the church and say that's where we are? Mm -hmm. That's where we are All as right. individuals who just sit there and do yes, our thing, yes, yes. and it is not an outward thing. Yes. <clears throat> Peter came. The Holy Spirit was able to use him because he had the knowledge of the Scripture. The Holy Spirit was able to use him because he believed he could be used by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was able to use him because he believed he could give it away. And that's what he did. So the elements of what he said were knowledge, faith, and hope. But I don't believe that's why the world was changed from that moment on. Let me just say, the world was changed from that moment on. Scripture says that people were added to the church daily after that. Yes. yes. Ooh, we need a little bit of that. We need to start Amen. adding people daily yeah, to this yeah, church. Yes, yes. Amen. Yes. Well, let me tell you why it was that people were added daily from this point on. Mm -hmm. See, in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 2, it talks about all those elements that I just talked about. The prophecy that Peter quoted from, the faith and the hope. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 2 says, If I speak in human or angels' languages but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Same chapter, verse 13, and now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So I'm going to tell this really quick story. When I was in high school, I was on the basketball team. Now I'm going to tell myself just slightly, and this is really hard to say, I say it and kind of laugh, but that's a nervous laugh. When I was uh, a teenager, I was um, kind of spiritually arrogant. I was very pious, and I just knew that I was exactly where I needed to be. And I felt bad for those who weren't. And um, we came home from a basketball trip after I had just heard my whole basketball team talking about all the parties and throwing up drunks and the drugs they were doing, and I was just disgusted. Just talking to my dad. So glad I'm not like them. Which in and of itself really sounds familiar, doesn't it? Remember the Pharisee on the corner saying, Thank you, God, that I'm not like them. I was like that at 16. Thank you, God. But my dad says, hmm, Sharon, interesting uh, conversation your attitude kind of shocks me what is it i can't remember what do you want to be when you grow up of course he was being sarcastic he could remember because i said it all the time i don't need to preach it that i don't want to preach i don't want to be evangelist so i thought just kind of curious to me how you minister to him if you don't love him and uh and i remember kind of picking myself up off the floor there and walking through my bedroom <laughs> very humble but i'll never forget that moment because, truly, we want to say that we want to bring the hope of God to the world around us. And then we mock the world around us. We want to say that we want to bring God's grace to those people who treat us badly. And then we turn around and treat them badly. How can we possibly yes, be the church yes, that God called yes, us to be yes. when we refuse right, to be now. that love that yes, God gave yes. unconditionally? All right. How powerful would it be if our church got the message that for God to love the world, yes, whosoever yes, 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 believed in God. I'm not talking about God so loved me. That's not the scriptures, the world, not me. Yes, Lord. God so loved me and my socioeconomic buddies that are in the same class as me. God so loved me and my political party. God so loved me in the United States of America, God bless the USA. No, God so loved the world. Those people that are holding their signs telling us that God hates us, God loves them too. Those people that have, that have bombed our country, God loves them too. Those people that are in political chaos around the world, God loves them too. The homeless man on the street holding the sign where you know he's been there five days, he probably has another job. God loves him too. God so loved the world. And how dare we ever rescind that love. God called us to love. So 
see I've gotten totally off, but that's okay. Yes, okay. All right. Right. Okay. This, this incredible moment in history where the Holy Spirit came down, it, it's about knowing the Scripture. It's about faith. It's about hope. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's even about tongues. Boy, that's a topic that is, I'm telling you what, mm, caused some serious issues in churches, divisions, theologies. But I think sometimes we read this scripture and we forget that it is a scripture that is all about love. And when we start talking in the language of God, remember 1 John 4, 9, God is love. If we speak the language of God, we better be speaking the language of love. And that's what this scripture is about. I truly, truly believe that if we as Christians seek the word of God, seek it to let it change us, Seek it to let it change us. Yes, yes, yes. And then choose to show that love to the world. Mm -hmm. This world will be a different place. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that you'd be blessed. Be a linguist with the love of God. Amen. Amen. Amen.